Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Aquarium of the Pacific. I'm Jerry Schubel, president of the Aquarium. I want to welcome all of you who are here in the theater and all of you who are at home watching online. I would ask that those of you who are in the, the theater, please put your cell phones on silent, silence them, put them on vibrate, and refrain from texting for the next hour. <clears throat> I want to acknowledge the sponsors that make this lecture series possible, Gazette Newspapers and the Courtyard Marriott downtown. You're going to hear a very important story tonight, and maybe some of you saw part of this if you watch 60 Minutes on Sunday evening. This is about these nodules on the seafloor that are rich in metals and uh, what countries are doing about trying to recover some of these because of the shortage of these metals that have become so important to our lives. And someone who is well in, uh, informed about all these issues, who is part of the company Deep Green, uh, which was featured on 60 Minutes, is Dr. Jason Smith. And he's the lead environmental scientist for the company Deep Green. Grew up in Rochester, New York, got his bachelor's and master's degrees at the University of Florida and his PhD at Stanford in Earth System Science. He has a, an academic career. He was at uh, MBARI, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, he, and he, so he was in academia for 12 or 15 years, and he recently joined Deep Green. And he's going to tell you the story of Deep Green and this whole idea of recovering minerals from the seafloor. And mining is a little bit of the, it may be a, a, the wrong term because these nodules sit on top of the seafloor and essentially the technology he will describe, you're vacuuming these, these up. This is a very important thing. The, his company, Deep Green, is a Canadian company. The U.S. is not engaged in the, the blue economy. We're the only leading maritime nation that is not. And I hope that by the end of Jason's talk, you will understand why it's important that the United States gets off the sidelines and starts to look at the ocean. Because inevitably, we will turn to the ocean in the future for more energy, more food, more minerals, even more fresh water. But at the same time, we will turn to the ocean increasingly to escape our overheated, overcrowded cities. So it's important that we maintain these ocean ecosystems that provide all the qualities that attract us to the ocean. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jason Smith. Uh, can you guys hear me? Good. Uh, so I'm here today as, uh, thank you, Jerry, for the introduction. As he said, I'm Jason Smith. I'm the lead environmental scientist for uh, Deep Green Metals, which is a uh, deep sea mining uh, startup focused on polymetallic poly nodule harvesting in the Pacific Ocean. So just a sort of quick overview of what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to take you on a little bit of a path. It's my own personal journey mixed with nodules. Uh, I'm first going to explain to you how I ended up here working for a mining company after many years in academe. Uh, then I'll define the problem that we see as a global one. Uh, then we'll move towards the way forward, uh, as far as what we see as a company as the way forward in solving these problems. And then we'll talk about our environmental program and how we're trying to conserve and prevent damage to the ocean as much as possible before doing it. And then I'll take your questions. So my academic career started in this barren landscape in the Florida Everglades. This is something called the hole in the donut. And what you see here is, um, all the soil of the ecosystem has been scraped away to deal with a, an invasive species. And so my master's research started with understanding how soil redevelops and how that um, alters carbon cycling in the natural environment over periods of decades of soil redevelopment, from initially from bedrock. From there, I moved on to work at NASA Ames Research Center studying exobiology in um, what they consider early Earth analog ecosystems. These are environments like this ancient marine pond in the Chihuahuan Desert filled with trematolites or very salty um, ecosystems on other parts of Mexico that NASA believes to be um, analogous to conditions on Mars. And we spent a lot of time doing experiments to understand the unique metabolism of these sort of ancient life forms and how um, it might explain life's ability to sustain itself here during early Earth or on planets such as modern-day Mars, which is very cold and salty. 
From there, I moved on to uh, work in biological oceanography at Stanford University as my PhD, and then further um, with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, which is pretty much right there. Um, and I, this is where I really fell in love with the ocean. I spent my entirety of my career studying the Pacific Ocean thus far and continue to do so working with Deep Green. Um, <clears throat> and from there, I, uh, after a decade or so of floating around the ocean and answering all the questions I could possibly think of, even though they're, they never really go away, uh, I moved on to UC Santa Barbara to do a brief foray in studying the kelp forest ecology and biogeochemistry of these systems, and this centered on the fact that they could not explain why kelp kept growing uh, offshore of Santa Barbara, even though there wasn't enough nitrogen, which is basically plant fertilizer in the water to sustain it. So we dug around for about a year, and we identified a new source of nitrogen to support the kelp growth, urea, which is excreted by the organisms that live within the reef, and so you could say that one being's uh, waste is another man's treasure. And so uh, you might say from 12 to 15 years of basically only extracting information from the ocean environment, why and how did you end up working in an extractive industry like deep sea mining? Uh, and I will tell you the story that was told to me when they recruited me uh, to work for them uh, come just about six months ago. It starts here with modern day resource extraction and demands. As of right now, 2017, we are extracting 92 billion tons of materials from this planet. This includes 44 Oops, sorry. 44 billion tons of sand, gravel, and clay. This goes to make cement and other building materials for our skyscrapers and foundations of our houses. 15 billion tons of fossil fuels, planes, trains, and automobiles, as you might expect. 9 billion tons of metal ore used to essentially build batteries for our various electronic devices and electric vehicles. And 24 billion tons of biomass, mostly in the form of wood that we use to build our houses and various other structures. To put this in perspective, on a per person average weight on the, on the planet, this, this equates to the average person on the planet using the weight of 12 elephants uh, per year in resources extracted from this planet, 12 tons. But this actually isn't uh, an accurate representation because this is heavily swayed towards the western of the developed world. So in, in developing countries, they use about two tons per person. In the Western world, in developed nations, industrialized nations, we use actually an average of 27 tons per person. And so this is, there's a, this is not a full representation, but you get my point is that this is a lot of material actually per person on the planet. And this is, particularly the extraction of fossil fuels and metal ores is having catastrophic, it produces 37 billion tons of CO2 emissions per annum, uh, the removal of fossil fuels and their burning, and extraction of metal ores creates 350 billion tons of waste. This is in fact the largest waste stream on the planet. These, of course, these extractive industries and the use of them are, as you all are very well aware, um, causing quite a bit of change on our planet where our, our climate is up uh, one plus one C. Sea level rise is up 15 centimeters or more, depending on. Chemical pollution is everywhere now. It's, on the, it's in the soils, it's in the groundwater, it's in our coastal waterways. It's even in the open ocean now. Um, and we have about 50% less of natural ecosystems and about 82% of wildlife biomass has been gone, or, or is gone now due to these extractive industries that are. And the problem with this is that we need more. So by 2060, it's, uh, this, is, I, this number is expected to double to be about 190 billion tons of resources. But to put this into perspective, I want to jog back to 1970. In 1970, there was required 27 billion tons of material was required and extracted from the planet to sustain society. In that time, in the 40 years, uh, well, I guess, uh, in that time, the population of the planet has doubled, but our resource utilization has tripled. And this is becoming an issue as you see going forward. There. Uh, so the reality is we need to rethink about how we are making our modern world. And mostly we need to start making decisions in the modern world that reduce the burden that we put on this planet as far as resource consumption and extracting things from the planet. Because if we continue to go forward in this way, it's going to be a game over scenario. The planet will, the planet will survive but it won't be livable for us. And so the obvious way forward, as, as uh, many of you are aware, is essentially to switch, to stop digging, stop burning fossil fuels, stop digging and drilling for oil and switch to renewables. And with metal ore, stop digging them up and recycle the metals. The Problem is this green transition, the shift to zero carbon power and electrifying industrial processes and global transport fleets, requires a massive amount of metals that are basically in the form of batteries. So if we're gonna stop burning fossil fuels, we need batteries to store energy from wind farms, from solar farms to power our vehicles, 
uh, amongst the number of consumer electronics that are used and consumed every day. Oh, so me. So the real the question. Let me go back one. So the real question here is like, how do this is a lot of material, and this actually does not include um, population plus uh, three billion people that are going to be added to the planet by the end of the century, or the um, <clears throat> or the increasing industrialization of developing countries, which is also going to create further demand for resources and batteries. And so this is actually a sort of bare minimum estimate. The question is, where do we get these materials? Do we keep digging on land, as we have been doing for about a century uh, now? The problem with digging on land right now, and this is a reality, is that ore grades are falling. So here you're looking at the percent grade of copper in uh, terrestrial-based metal rocks, basically. And here's nickel. And what you're seeing is a downward trend in both curves from 1900 to essentially near present. Today's average is about 0.5% by weight of copper. And nickel's also in a downward trend, although that is clear. The problem with this is that if ore grade continues to go down, we have to essentially blast and pull more rock out of the planet to get the same amount of metals needed to build these batteries. And the problem with continuing to blast more and more is that we dig deeper and deeper and we continue to do things like destroy ecosystems. So Indonesia is a good example of it's the world's number one nickel producer, but it's also the world's number three most biodiverse country on the planet. So typically rainforests are cut down in order to enable uh, nickel mining. And so if we need more nickel, we have to make more mines, we have to dig deeper, which means we're going to destroy more rainforests. Rainforests are among the most biodiverse ecosystems on the planet, and they're also very instrumental in helping the client the the climate offset CO2 increases in the atmosphere. And continuing to dig uh, on land and build and burn and break more rock is also going to cause more emissions. Uh, this is a picture of a Russian copper production factory. Um, but the inherent, the CO2 is produced naturally through the process of essentially refining metal ores. And the, again, the low quality metal ore means we have to do more of this, which is going to create more CO2. It's going to create more uh, fluorocarbons and also more uh, Sulfur, fluoro, sulfur hexafluorides, which are very potent greenhouse gases that stay in the atmosphere for upwards of a thousand years. And of course, as you, many of you are also probably well, are well aware, continuing to refine metal ore is also going to consume tons and tons of fresh water, which is going to ultimately result in very large tailings, as you see here from a nickel mining plant in Ontario. And these tailings dams, are, oftentimes these tailings aren't treated, they're just held in very big natural dams that have breached several times in the last couple of years, and they will continue to do as they continue, will continue to do so as we continue to allow these materials to accumulate in mass. And of course, um, more child labor and more deaths. And so everyone's aware, um, frequently there are accidents in these mines in Chile, and uh, this is one recently 43 people died in a Glencore mine in the Congo. Um, and so this is going to continue to happen as well because humans have to be in the loop here in a very big way. Um, and also there's an estimated 40,000 children working in artisanal cobalt mines in the Congo. And so if we continue again to expand the need for cobalt, there's likely to be a bigger pay and of child labor going into the Congo as well as they are one of the number one producers of, of cobalt. So the reality right now is this. The 20th century was the age of fossil fuels. This is an era where we extracted fossil fuels from the planet on a really consistent basis, and we, got, we made bigger cars, and we made bigger planes, and we just needed more and more fuel, and we just keep taking more and more out. The 21st century, the 21st century is essentially the age of metals, but we're in the same, we're in the same exact game. We're basically we're expanding, society's expanding its demand, we're having to pull more metal out of the planet to make more batteries, et cetera. So is this really the way forward? Is the way forward to continue breaking ore on land and pulling out more and more rock and devastating more of these ecosystems that are already so deeply devastated. And this is where I eagerly jumped aboard into this conversation when I was approached from Deep Green and made it, I, I decided that I was going to work in this industry uh, after an academic career because I felt like this was a compelling question that's of global relevance. And so the reason that I joined Deep Green is because we have a planned evolution and it does not involve being a mining company forever. In fact, this company is in it to disrupt and change the metals game. It happens in three chapters. Chapter one, which is what we're gonna talk about today because this is where we're at, is to get more virgin metals with the least environmental and social impact possible to the planet. This does not mean blasting more ore from rocks on the land. Second option, the second, the second chapter of our, our company's outlook is to essentially begin to recycle these virgin metals that we put in so that we don't have to mine anymore. We only want to mine for 30 years, get enough metals for the batteries that are needed to electrify the global fleet, and then we want to move on to recycling first the metals we produce, which is manganese, copper, cobalt, and nickel, 
And then by the end, the last chapter of this, of this company, really the vision is to be a full-on metals recycling company so we don't have to mine anymore. The idea about here being that by by time we can recycle everything, we enter into a full-on green closed-loop economy. And our focus always has been out on <clears throat> electrifying the global the global car fleet. And so if you, if you look right here, this is an average 75 kilowatt hour battery with a nickel manganese cobalt uh, 811 chemistry. You're looking at 85 kilograms of copper, 56 kilograms of nickel, and seven kilograms each of cobalt and manganese. This is for a single electric vehicle battery. By year 2047, 30 years, well, just, over, just under 30 years from now, there's expected to be one billion electric vehicles on the planet. So if you multiply these numbers by a billion, you're starting to look at a whole lot of metals. The question is, where are they gonna come from? As we discussed, they can come from land. There is some attempts within the community to make mining slightly greener, but they're lagging quite a bit behind. Uh, and as we discussed, grades are falling and reserves in bio, and the reserves are in biodiverse places where you're also losing rainforests and other um, very important ecosystems of the planet. Um, the other option which we've entertained and are quite serious about um, investigating as a feasible option is um, oceans. So the ocean has three kinds of metals, essentially, as far as solids and metals. Um, Two of these were, uh, one of these is unlike the other. So C4 massive sulfides form in black smokers near hydroform events. These essentially, you like, like C4 crust, which form in the sort of mid-Atlantic ridge. This is basically rock that has to be the same thing that happens on, the same thing that happens on land with these happens under the water here. We have to, these have to be blasted into tiny pieces of rock, pulled up to a ship, brought to shore, refined, broken down, metals. It's exactly the same as it happens on land. It's just on, at sea, so it's arguably actually more labor intensive. What we're interested in working on is polymetallic nodules. These are essentially golf ball to potato sized um, little rocks that sit only on the seabed in the upper two centimeters of the seabed. They're sort of like golf balls on a putting green. I guess at the driving range where the guy drives around and just picks up the balls after you hit them. And there's an abundance of them. And so if we look at nodules as a source of of battery metals, it actually is, uh, it's quite serendipitous that it works this way, but nodules uh, contain high concentrations of the four metals we need to make um, basically lithium ion batteries for cars. In fact, um, a very prominent uh, electric car manufacturing executive called them a nickel manganese cobalt battery in a rock. And so let's just explore differences between nodules um, and land-based ores of sourcing these metals required to make batteries. And so here you have a high-grade polymetallic nodule. You have high concentrations of manganese, nickel, cobalt, and copper in one single rock. Go to land ores, you can't get all these metals from, from one rock. You actually need three sources of rock, which means you need three mines. And you can get a little bit of cobalt, but the point being here is that we need more mines and more mining for land-based sourcing than we would for just picking up nodules that are sitting on the seafloor. And these, again, are as very different sources as, as you might. We need four times, we estimate, four times more material from land than we would by just using nodules to get the same exact amounts of metals. And so there's an advantage here of just not having to move as much material um, through the system. And finally, um, one amazing advantage of nodules is that there's basically no zero waste. Nodules contain none of the toxic metals and other tailings that come with um, land-based ores. And therefore, we essentially have a no tailings or toxic waste um, stream of bringing metals to the market. Comparably, um, I think over the lifetime of a billion, making a billion uh, EV batteries, you'll get 64 gigatons, 64 gigatons of basically tailings of waste on the planet from using land-based orders to build these batteries. And so we've done what we want to dig a little bit deeper than just comparing these sort of coarsely. And so we spent uh, nine months dealing with a number of elite academics amongst other McKinsey consultants to study the impacts of using nodules versus land-based ores to source these battery, needed battery metals. And we looked at greenhouse gas emissions, economics, human health and thriving, biodiversity, carbon sequestration, non-living resources and habitats, and ecosystem services. And we um, did a full cradle to gate analysis and life cycle analysis on these various parameters. And I'm not gonna go through the, it's a 180 page document, so I'm not gonna go through it all today. Um, but you can see here is the sort of the general summary. And so, what you're seeing is this is the impacts of nodules relative to land-based ores. And so everywhere you see green, uh, this, is a, this is where uh, impacts are reduced by use of nodules compared to land-based ores for the, um, in the same exact scenario. And so what you're seeing is massive reductions in the, obviously the amount of ore used, the amount of land taken up, the amount of water used. The seabed obviously is gonna go up because we're gonna uh, pick the nodules up from it. CO2 emissions are down 70%. 
There was a 94% reduction in the loss of stored carbon in the, in the Earth environment, 100% decrease in solid waste, ecotoxicity and toxicity to basically waterways is all drastically down, including to humans and human lives and wildlife populations. And so there's also, and this is a known, no matter where you do this, there's a present and known risk of biodiversity loss, no matter if you're on land or at sea. And so this is sort of the, in the nutshell, I think takeaway for me is this, the, the abundance of green here is pretty strongly pointing towards, I think nodules are the way to go to source these metals in a sustainable way that is looking on a planetary level of what's the best decision for the planet. So where are these nodules? The nodules are located actually, there's nodules located in all four, in four major ocean basins, but the one of primary interest is the Clareton clipperton fracture zone. So this is about 500 miles uh, south of Hawaii in the middle of the North Central Pacific Ocean. And it's this area, the nodules are all wedged in this area between the Clipperton fracture, the Clarion fracture zone and the Clipperton fracture zone. And in this area, there's 34 billion tons of nodules, which is enough to electrify the global car, car fleet four times over. So although this area only accounts for 1% of the global seabed, this is actually 3.5 million square miles, or also as notice the size of all of Europe. Each of these individual blocks is only 70,000 square uh, kilometers. I think. And we're not the first ones to uh, entertain the idea of har harvesting nodules from the seafloor um, to get base metals. In fact, a lot of this work was done in the 70s by uh, Kenneth Cooper Company, Mitsubishi Corp, essentially, uh, Shell Petroleum and Amico. Uh, Lockheed Martin was involved for a while. And they all basically backed out, and they backed out for several reasons. One, the technology wasn't there to essentially make this, the harvesting of them feasible on an economic level. Two, the demand in the market for metals wasn't high enough for them to continue pushing the boundaries of making money. And three, there was no regulations. At this point, I think it's well established that the demand for base battery metals is very, very high now. Um, and the technology, as I will show you, is there for us to essentially harvest these things in an economically viable manner. And there are also now regulations. So in 1994, um, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea uh, established the International Seabed Authority. And this is basically um, a miniature UN for ocean-related things, and uh, there's many member countries. Uh, the US is not involved in this, as many of you, as Jerry mentioned. Um, <clears throat> and so in 94, this was established. In 2011, the, in 2001, they issued the first exploration contract. So I should clarify that exploration is only the ability to go in and feasibly assess whether or not this is economically viable. We can't make any money off this. We got our rights to our Nori area in 2011. And then uh, in 2020, a year just shortly, uh, early next year, the official regulations for exploitation will be put into place. And now uh, it will enable the possibility of um, people working commercially to harvest metals from the sea. And so we, Deep Green, have two blocks in the CCZ. Uh, the, the red ones here, Marwa, these are in collaboration with uh, the nation of Kiribati, which is a Pacific Island nation. And the yellow ones, the Nori blocks, are um, with their licensing collaboration with another Pacific nation called Nauru. Uh, we will first begin exploring uh, commercial operations in the, no the Nori blocks um, in collaboration with Nauru. So I'm not sure many of you are familiar with Nauru, but it was heavily mined by the Australians for phosphates for a long, long time, and the center of the island is just devastated, and uh, they don't have much economy. And so part of this, part of pairing with these Pacific Island nations is the hope that we can essentially bolster their economy through the revenue that sources that come through um, these commercial mining operations. And so uh, you might be wondering at this point how are we going to collect these nodules. I'll show you a brief video, engineering video here it's a, uh, of the operation as planned.
right, so well, I'll just take you through uh, what the video showed just so you're familiar with the engineering before we start talking about the environmental impacts of these operations, which is of broad concern um, to society and to us. Uh, so we have basically uh, a main engineering ship, and uh, there's a, a, a main en engineering ship which will deploy the robots. In our plan right now, there'll be two to four of them out there at once. Uh, the nodules they collect will be shot up the, harvest, or the riser pipe on deck where they'll be dewatered and transferred to this uh, basically transport vessel that will take them to shore for refinement. This deep seawater that gets shot up to deck will get pushed back down into essentially um, the deep mesopelagic below the thermocline, so it will never enter or be seen in the surface ocean at all. Um, and then, um, <clears throat> so the main impacts of this operation are pretty much threefold. So one um, acknowledges that nodule Nodule removal, or essentially is the removal of hard substrate from a very otherwise soft bedded ocean ecosystem. And so this essentially takes um, housing and homes away from places, things that rely on these substrates, such as squids and various other gelatinous organisms that attach to the nodules and then feed, filter feed through the, through the water column for food. Um, we, I mean, this is an acknowledged loss. We're taking away nodules um, for battery metals to support the larger societal goal here, but 34% of this ecosystem has been set aside by the seabed authority to never be touched. So it's not gonna be completely mined, strip mined, raised, and gone. So on top of that, 10 to 30% of, um, <clears throat> of basically everyone's contract area that they would mine in, are, there's gonna be no, no take zones left. And so the sum of these, if you add up all the contractors, is there upwards, there's chances of upwards of 50% of the ecosystem never being mined or touched, and the nodules being left in place. Um, and then we will leave behind 15% of the nodules during our, during our operations, and part of this is an engineering decision in hopes that we could help basically promote reestablishment of the system after we disturb it. The second major environmental issue associated with these operations is plumes. So as the nodules sit on the seabed, and the, the way the underwater harvester vehicles will work is they will sink in a little bit, and they will pull the nodules in, but when that, they also look, as when you dig potatoes, they're gonna pull a little bit of dirt too. And that mud will be separated from the nodules as they go up the riser pipe and the, the, basically the superficial sediments will be dispensed back and they will create um, sediment plume. And uh, the sediment plume has the environmental impacts of it are a little bit unknown. We're, we have an intense modeling effort going on right now to understand um, the plume dynamics long before we carry out any operations, um, mostly in hopes of informing our design of our vehicles to minimize impacts. But the impacts of the plume are essentially um, the potential for it to smother superficial organisms as the sediment lays back down. It's possible that it, um, some gelatinous organisms could be smothered, and it may alter the, um, the feeding behaviors of filter feeding organisms that pull in water to get planktonic and organic matter out. And then the third um, impact is the return water. So this is deep water that's pushed up to the vessel and then drained from the nodules and then pushed back into the deep sea. Um, <clears throat> This is really, the, only, the, big, the big thing here is that it's water that was at a deeper depth than it, than it is now. And we actually haven't decided if we're gonna put it all the way back to where it's from, but it has very little sediment in it and maybe some, a few chunks of nodules. But throughout this whole operation, you have to realize there's nothing being put into the natural environment or moved around in the natural environment, environment that wasn't there. There's no chemicals involved in this operation or anything. It's really purely a displacement of materials or removal of them. And so <clears throat> we are well aware and cognizant and concerned about dis the disturbance to deep sea wildlife. And you know, the big groups that we pay attention to are essentially charismatic megafauna. You're looking at things like halotherians, uh, corals, this newly discovered order of nadarians um, that was discovered by Diva Amman a couple of years ago. Um, and, then, and then myofauna, which these are essentially a very small, I think sub-millimeter sized worms that live in the sediment. There's a very diverse array of assemblages of them. Um, and they will likely get passed through the harvesters, some of which will be their demise, and some may be fine. Um, so these are, these are sort of the main organisms that we're concerned about with our operations. And we're very actively, before we ever disturb this ecosystem, going through and trying to catalog and understand the diversity and function of these assemblages so that we can really try to prevent or plan where we mine so we can min minimize disturbance or catastrophic loss of any one group. And I will show you uh, a video from one of our recent surveys where we began uh, collecting 3,500 biological samples for initial analysis. I'm Adrian Hellman. I'm here working with Arius Group, which is an Australian-based 
environmental company and yeah, I'm here to lead the biology team to collect biological samples throughout our survey. So we've got a, quite a detailed process of sampling the box course. The first thing we'll do, you'll see us, the box will come up and if we have water over the top of the box, we'll actually collect that water and we'll sieve it through a very fine 32 micron sieve. And the reason for that is we want to retain all the very small animals that are living in the water close to the seabed and also that have been washed off the surface of the sediment on the way up. You'll see us selecting any animals that we can see attached to the nodules or on the surface of the sediment itself. So these animals are generally small corals, small sponges, some really interesting creatures and it's, it's really the most interesting part of what we're doing out here for us personally. With most of the other animals are actually too small to even see with the human eye. After we've removed all the animals that we can see on the surface of the core, we actually insert these what we call push cores and what they do is they retain a perfect sample showing the different horizons of sediment and what we're aiming to do there is to actually sample a horizon based tube which we can send to the lab and look at the different animals at different depths and we can use that to compare across all the different sites that we're sampling and on top of that the additional cores we have will be used for sediment chemistry purposes and that's where we can actually compare the chemistry type in the substrate and look at the effects that has on the biota. A unique aspect of this work is the fact that we are so far offshore and we're in international waters. So this is all controlled by the International Seabed Authority. What that means is that the environmental data we're collecting is really important and it's great that Deep Green has allowed us to come onto these geological trips and collect biological data. Um, it's just going to build on our knowledge base and it's going to assist them when it gets to the production phase because we're going to have a really good understanding of the environmental communities down there. Uh, I don't need the lights on, but I just want to sort of emphasize all these samples that we're collecting are intended to um, give us a robust understanding of the environmental baseline of the biological communities long before disturbed. We're not analyzing them ourselves. In fact, a lot of these are farmed out and contracted to academic scientists and experts in the deep sea, particularly the CCZ itself. Um, so we are very serious about this and we acknowledge the impacts of uh, the operations on these communities. And so we're trying to do our best to further understanding before uh, disturbance. But this doesn't stop at the sediment, so it's an entire ecosystem. And so this next one I'll show you is a recent uh, cruise where we deployed a two and a half mile long mooring to study uh, conditions in the water column from surface to bottom, including uh, hydrophones to study the movement of mammals, um, salinity temperature currents to better model uh, the sediment plumes. Oops. My name is Chris Kelly and I am the Chief Scientist at uh, CSA Ocean Sciences uh, for the Nori D survey. Hey, I'm Frank Johnson with CSA Ocean Sciences and I'm uh, the Operations Manager for uh, this project. So the primary objective of, of this study is to look at the seasonality of water uh, conditions within the Nori D region. So what we do is we take samples at various times throughout the year as well as uh, collect uh, mooring data throughout the year. We, we put out three large moorings into the area that uh, will look at salinity, temperature, and other variable parameters. So what we want to do is before anything occurs within the block, before any mining occurs within the block, there has to be a full environmental impact assessment that occurs. And in order to inform that environmental impact assessment, we have to use the model and we have to use the data uh, collected to inform that model so that we can get a very good snapshot of, of what is in the area. So we can, if we can get a better handle on the conditions of the area, then you can better determine any of the potential impacts that occur from that. And uh, that's no easy feat, um, not at all. You know, the moorings are, the longest moorings about 4,000 meters long, and uh, the other ones uh, are, are 500 meters and 32 meters, and they go really deep into the, uh, the ocean. First, we collect uh, water samples by use of a 24 position uh, water sampling carousel. So that carousel has 24 bottles on it, and we send it down to about 4,200 meters to the bottom of the ocean and collect water at 16 depths as we go down. It takes about two hours to get down and two hours to get back up, so it takes a while to, to do that. And once it's on deck, we collect that water. Uh, we send a lot of it to an analytical laboratory 
but then we process some of it on board to figure out some nutrient concentrations as well as uh, total sediments within the water. We're also collecting a lot of the water quality parameters, CTD, DO, pH, redox. Uh, we're doing uh, currents, we're doing upward and downward looking currents. Uh, those are attached to the rosette as well, the carousel. So we're collecting a bunch of different data real time as in addition to the water samples that we'll get analyzed once they get processed and sent off the vessel. We've got some acoustic sensors on there that'll pick up. Uh, yeah, uh, any, any noise within the region, any, any mammals, any vessel mammal traffic. Noise, yeah, vessel noise. On each of the moorings, we actually have sediment traps as well. And so those sediment traps will uh, capture, uh, give us an idea of uh, flux of particles from the surface going to seafloor. And that'll give us a good idea of baseline flux within the region so that um, we can characterize that versus uh, any impacts from uh, mining activities. The other data that we collect, that'll actually be placed into a model. And that model will, uh, will show um, the subsea currents and the subsea flows and the subsea conditions over time and so what that'll do is it'll get a, a really good long-term record of, of what the conditions are within the region so that when Nori does start mining activities that they can have a good idea of what the conditions are there to fulfill their environmental assessment impact. We have to spool the cable onto a, onto a mooring winch. We'll start with the very highest moorings, the very highest uh, flotation and we'll add the sensors to each depth that they need to be collected and then we'll trail those buoys and the, and the sensors themselves behind the vessel as, as we add each additional piece on. As we add those on, it gets further and further behind. So at one point, we've actually got about 4,000 meters of cable dragging behind the vessel. When we go past the point that we want to, to uh, deploy it, we'll uh, actually take the railroad clump, the clump weight that, that holds everything to the, to the seafloor, um, and then we'll push it off. And as it goes in, it takes everything else with it. It's, it's the last thing to go in, it's the first thing to hit. Uh, so it'll hold everything in a nice straight strain. And we've calculated and then modeled anything that could happen if we have, have bad currents, uh, any of that tilting that could go on. Uh, so we've uh, taken that into consideration with all the flotation that we've added. We want to make sure that all those sensors are straight up in the water column at the most in a really bad current, no more than at a 10 degree angle. There's challenges in being five days away from any near support. Uh, so we've got to make sure that we've got every I dot and every T cross. So I think I think we uh, that's the challenge for us to make sure we've got everything. It, it's always gratifying. We had a, it was a huge team effort for us to come out here and put all this together. We had a team of seven, so there's a lot of people to make sure that this, yeah. this went well. So for now, this part of the operation I think was was basically just about flawless. We've been planning for this yeah, we've been, for yeah, about six I've months I've been working now. on this since April of yeah. 2019, and it's been almost my full-time job. So yeah. I think we've pretty much got every objective that we want wanted to meet. We, we fulfilled that. Now all we have to do is make sure we get the data back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That'll be the next survey. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, but we've yeah. done everything we can to make sure that that occurs. Oh, uh, so hopefully that will give you some understanding of the sort of level of resources, both financially and sort of uh, brain power going into understanding every um, detail of this environment um, from the surface to the seabed um, before we ever impose disturbance. In fact, the ISA does not mandate us to do this much work, but we have um, a total of 11 survey campaigns um, going out there between now and 20, October 2022. And this is 11 survey campaigns of five week long. So we will spend 55 weeks in this environment studying it more than a year um, before we ever make a single dollar or a dollar can even be made. And so. Uh, there is a concern in our company and I think broadly within the community that's trying to harvest nodules to make sure that we do this right because we do understand the sensitivity of the ecosystem. But there's also a bigger global uh, question and problem that needs to be addressed. And so we, uh, beyond sort of establishing a robust baseline, we, you know, we have two big things that, we, uh, that guide us. One is that we, if we ever um, feel like we're imposing serious irreparable harm on the deep sea environment on a broader scale, we will completely stop operations and find another way forward to this, uh, an answer to this problem. The other way is that we are committed to um, a net gain in ocean health and biodiversity, and we're working through um, innovations to increase biodiversity on various scales, particularly those that matter to people. Um, not everyone is concerned about worms in the deep sea, others may be concerned about corals. Um, and to improve ocean health on regional to basin-wide scales. 
and one thing that's being entertained right now is whether or not we spread trillions of artificial nodules back to the CCZ to facilitate ecosystem recovery. It's a very slow recovering ecosystem. Or do we uh, use things like heat resistant corals from Kiribati to regrow coral reefs in areas with coral die offs? And you know, these are very highly diverse. They're essentially rainforest ecosystems in the ocean. And so, you know, there's, there's value as far as increasing overall ocean health and diversity to doing such things as well. And with that, is, uh, that is my journey. And this is the most important, exciting, and uh, challenging one that I've been on thus far in my career. And hopefully you've taken away some understanding of the global concern and need for metals and to find a supply that's most sustainable and that's least damaging to the planet. And an understanding of how um, we're going about trying to prevent um, putting irreparable harm and damages on the ocean while um, trying to also um, decrease damages on a global scale from uh, sourcing metals from land. And I uh, can't do this without, uh, there's about 15, 17 of us now. It's a small but a uh, very uh, fast working team. And many of us aren't actually miners and haven't worked in mining at all. And as I said before, we don't really want to be miners in 30 years. We're just trying to find a way forward to enable this green transition over the next 30 years through sourcing metals sustainably. And with that, I thank you and I will take questions. Jason, th thank you very much. It, has there been any thought of discharging that water near the surface? Because it, um, it's almost certainly higher in nutrients than in trace metals. It would stimulate primary productivity. The CO2 would be removed from the atmosphere. You could be heroes. That's why we don't want to do it. <laughs> you can see it. Why? You can see it from space. Um, no, this has been discussed. So on the front end, if you think about a mining company causing a giant phytoplankton bloom out in the middle of the ocean, and some people are going to think it looks kind of bad. But there's been discussion about, yeah, carbon sequestration is a possibility, and there's been discussion internally about the possibility of using that water to support aquaculture in the open ocean, right? If you're pushing forward, basically, productivity. Uh, there has been discussion, but the general feeling right now is that it's a little bit too early to start doing that. But it's mostly because of public perceptions. I no, I think there's a scientific concern that we don't know fully on, full on what's going to happen and how big and expansive the bloom is going to be. All right, who has a question? Raise your hand, I'll bring you a microphone. And, and by the way, as you know, we're working with Kiribati on super corals. Yeah. And uh, we want to tell that story here. So if a checkbook with you, uh, Deep Green could write a check. <laughs> uh, we can talk about that offline. <laughs> Speaking of checkbooks, uh, first of all, that was a very impressive uh, presentation. And I can see the spin-off science coming out of this. It's going to be like the space project giving us Velcro and all yeah. these other things. So. That's a good byproduct. Who's funding this? Uh, private investors. Uh, a number of people, um, Silicon Valley and a bunch of other. There's some strategic partnerships um, with Maersk and Alsees. Oh, Alsees is, we're in a strategic alliance with Alsees to build our vessels and build the underwater tractors. And could you, you give us a quick overview on how the nodules are actually formed? That is a really hard question to answer. Uh -huh. uh, it's actually not fully understood, and that is one of people's reservations is that we don't fully know how they, they, they basically, um, they form around essentially like a shark's tooth or a pebble, and they continue to like nuclear around and grow out. The growth rates are unknown. Um, they, there are some estimates that they take about a million years to form. Who has the next one? Go ahead. Um, I did watch the TV. Um, um, 60 Minutes? 60 Minutes. It was absolutely phenomenal. And I'm mm -hmm. so happy you're here this evening. I had two things. You mentioned artificial nodules and what are they made out of. And with, with the nodules that are gotten, do you have to use any type of special clothing? What type of things do you have to do to protect your body so there's no risk of any type of um, health um, challenges or... Has there been any studies about what effect this is having? Does it have any adverse effect to a person being exposed to these elements? I don't. So the first question, the artificial nodules, that's a very young idea being developed um, largely by a um, consortium of people in the Netherlands. And I believe the idea would be to essentially take a rock and then um, through a kiln process, put a manganese layer on top of it. The feasibility of doing so at sea or carting around tens of thousands of tons of rocks is also being assessed. Um, there, but there's current and active recolonization studies going on through a group in the, in the Netherlands. Um, regarding 
uh, exposure risks. I'm not aware of any. Um, we, as you see on the vessels, just wear coveralls, and all the engineers that deal with these wear coveralls. I can't speak to it when it gets into the metallurgy process on land. I'm a bit removed, but I haven't heard of any toxicity issues that you would think with some of the ores. Yeah, I, I think to reinforce, uh, it's clear that we're depending more and more on these metals. Uh, not only for batteries in cars, but uh, cell phones. On, uh, the, right. And it's not only going to, the demand will increase as population increases, but also as the uh, industrialization of developing countries. Right. And we're, the, the quality of the ore on land is going down sort of to generate the same amount as you would from the ocean. You have to process much more and it causes environmental damage. These are on the surface of the seafloor, mm -hmm. and so you're essentially vacuuming them up, and, and as far as we know, the damage would be small to the, to the seafloor. Well, the, the, you know, the ISA won't let us go any deeper, I think, in our engineering level of 30 centimeters. We chose a threshold much shallower than that of disturbance, so you're looking at a maximum of 15 to 20 centimeters of sediment layer being disturbed. Um, versus a strip mining situation, which keeps going down. And the exploratory drilling, uh, recovery mining is going on, is beginning to happen now, but no exploitation. Yeah, there's no exploitation licenses have been issued by the ISA for any single industry that's looking for metals in the ocean. Everything is ex completely exploratory right now. And when this was announced uh, early this year, Marsha McNutt, who now is the president of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and the Institutes of Medicine. Previously, she was the head of Science Magazine, and before that, she was the director at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. There were some of her colleagues in the academic world who were bemoaning the fact that we would be thinking about doing anything in the ocean, and Marsha's comment was, hooray, we need to do stuff to figure out how to do things better. And I think, that, that we live on a finite planet with finite resources, and we're going to have to figure out how to use 70% of this planet. And then, I mean, if you watch 60 Minutes, you've heard the argument. There's, I mean, this is 1% of the seabed, and I'm not saying that's you know, not an important part of the seabed, but we're talking 1% of a very, very vast ocean. Okay. What we've seen here is pretty passive uh, uh, vacuuming, mm -hmm. but the 60 Minutes uh, sec uh, session showed this huge uh, tractor-like mm -hmm. vehicle that's going to be dropped on the ocean floor Correct. and it's going to move. So it's going to scrub the things up. Yep. And that means that uh, at the same time that we're discovering all kinds of sea life that we've never imagined, we're going to be killing a lot of it too. Yep. How are you guys going to mitigate that? Well, I mean, that's it's a tricky one to mitigate. I mean, that's the, one of the most contentious parts of this conversation is essentially the loss of particularly undiscovered biodiversity. I think, one, um, we are going to very actively, as you saw, continue. I mean, by the end of this month, we'll have 7,000 samples in storage. So when these go to the experts, they can look and be like, is there continuity here? Because one of the things we're trying to figure out is that the CCZ is so big, it's the size of Europe, we don't know and understand habitat connectivity and to know whether or not gummy squirrel here is the only gummy squirrel in all of Europe or if there's another one. We don't, there's not enough information. So what we're trying to do is essentially enable as much science as possible going forward so that we can at least get as far as possible there. And as far as mitigation, um, again, besides trying to increase overall sort of ocean health and biodiversity, the mitigations on the exact environment are still being discussed. And one option would be if we identify a certain type of nodule or something like that, a size, there's several size classes. Um, we'll try our best to leave those ones behind because they might be a sensitive habitat and other ones might not be. And it, it's true, you, you, you'll kill some things. The question is what's the regeneration time for some of these animals that would be destroyed and what right. what the- Right, active is, studies going on for that right now. Right. And, and um, if you might look back at some early research done in the 70s and. Mm -hmm. Uh, by Carl Tariki and Don Rhodes at Yale University, that some disturbance of the seafloor stimulates productivity. Yep, there's a some disturbance. There's a little bit of a yeah. There's a disc all experiment off Peru that arguable. <laughs> I consistently ask my children, "What did you learn today that you didn't know yesterday?" And I ask the same question to myself before going to bed. I want to thank you, Jason, because I learned a lot today. You're welcome. Thanks for having me.
No, you're not. A, you're not mm. <laughs> I, I know. I, I used to work for Jerry. <laughs> I'm a friend of Jason's. Um, <laughs> So my question is about the water return. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that you're not exactly sure what the plan is in terms of where in the water column you'll, you'll be returning the water. So there's an active discussion in the community about what the best way to do it is. So my thought about that was in relation to the songs plume. Um, are you aware of that in terms of the, um, the San Onofre nuclear generator? Yeah, that's a much, that's a much larger temperature, temperature differential though. But it's not about the temperature. So what I thought was really interesting and possibly related to this was that what actually turned out to be the uh, killer of the kelp forest that they um, have planted there, the, the kelp restoration project, mm -hmm. was the turbidity in the water, not the temperature change. Right. And the turbidity was related to the essentially chewed up sea life mm -hmm. that went through the generator and was spit out. Right. Um, so I guess my question was just, you know, is that something that's being considered? Is that a model that's being looked at and compared to, you know, what you're looking at? Because I think that might be something that could be interesting to compare it to. I've not heard the exact phrase chewed up sea life. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> There's, yeah. <laughs> it's not a pretty there's, image, little chewed up worms. There, there's active concern and discussion both within the academic community and folks at MIT and Hawaii about um, how to do this right. And um, part of these things we're not going to learn until we do it. And there's an acknowledgement broadly that until one of these operations goes into test mining, we're not going to, we can't predict it all. And so before we ever go to full scale commercial mining, we have to do a test mining scenario. We have to write an entire impact statement based on mining a very small plot within the domain. And we'll learn a lot there, and some of these things I think are going to be learned by doing. Um, and the, the concentration of sediment in this water is far greater than the cooling water at uh, San Onofre, and it'll change the density. Less than, I think only 0.1% uh, of all material that um, essentially is disturbed on the seabed is going to go up the riser pipe. It's a very, very dilute plume as far as particulates. The big concern is buoyancy and chemical properties, where you put that. Uh, two questions, one for Jerry, I'll wait. That's question number two. But number one, all this discussion about batteries, there hasn't been any discussion about lithium, which is a very polluting process of harvesting lithium. So if you're going to build all these batteries, where are you going to get the lithium? That's a good question. Let me get back to you on that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We're concerned with the other four. <laughs> the I, other I'm not, I'm not, I'm, my ba I'm not super familiar with lithium sourcing, so I do apologize. Okay. Well, my question for Jerry is, if, if you're talking about trade-offs under the ocean being worthwhile, does that mean that in order to get more water to Southern California, we can kill the Delta smelt? No. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there's, there's active research going on looking for substitutes for lithium. And uh, we need a, a, a cathode and an anode. The cathode is something that likes to give up electrons. Lithium does. But there are other things that like to give up electrons even more than lithium. And so that's an active area of research. Who has the next one? Well, an alternative for the Delta <laughs> You mentioned that there is a, some kind of a turbulence or event that happens in the ocean that ends up creating these nodules. And you did talk a little bit about fracture zones. Mm -hmm. Now, does that refer to tectonic plates, or is it something else? Yeah, tectonics, fracture zones. I, I don't, are you saying, is, is, that where, is that why the nodules are there? Uh, I, I don't, I'm, yes, I, I believe that is a major contributor to why they're there. Yeah, because that would have... But to less, the, so you have where, where the, the uh, mantle comes to the sea, sea floor, it's rich in, in some of these metals, and right. then they get precipitated out, and o over hundreds of thousands and millions of years, you form these, these nodules. So they, they tend to be in greater concentrations. Because they're also in areas where there's active sea mounts, too, and there's a whole source of metals that contributes there, too. And there's, uh, this is a... There's little morsels of data out of Woods Hole and stuff that suggests relationships between proximity to seamounts and stuff, but it's not really, I wouldn't say, concrete as far as far more theory or hypothesis. Go ahead. 
the United States is not involved in this. Do you know, have there been any efforts to try to get the United States involved? And if not, what needs to be done to see about them seriously considering and joining everyone uh, that is? My understanding is they can't get through the Senate, and they've tried two to three times now. And uh, I would say write your congressperson. Yeah, the, and uh, Bob said new administration, but this has gone yeah, through. Yeah, I wasn't going to get into that. This has, gone <laughs> through, this has gone through a no number of mid administrations. We, we signed the Convention on the Law of the Sea, but then we never ratified it. We're the only significant maritime nation in the world that is not, has not acceded to the Convention on the Law of the Sea, and that's what gives you legitimacy in looking to the ocean to benefit society. Now, we can do it as an outlaw nation, and this is what's been threatened. That's not exactly what we should do. Alex. Yeah, mine has to do with the enormous amount of investment that's going into a project like this. Mm -hmm. And um, the payoff that is expected at the other end. My question is, at what point is there a, a breaking of the deal. I mean, how many millions? Oh, do we have to spend before we just give up? Yeah. That is above my pay grade. <laughs> I don't, I'm not in on those conversations, but I mean, I imagine. Huh? Oh, I can only speak to our like environmental program. I don't know how much is being spent on development of everything else. But you're going to spend several hundred million dollars before you recover. Is that right? Some on, the, on the overarching whole project, yes, I would assume that's correct, yes. Yeah. With the engineering and stuff. Um, right. The environmental program is upwards of... Anybody who hasn't had a dollars. chance to ask a question? Uh, I want to make an addendum to the question that I asked previous about the fracture zones. Since tectonic plates have something to do with it, and that much of the surface of this earth was once covered by ocean, is it not possible that these nodules could be discovered in terrestrial areas as well? Yeah, that's a tough one. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. When I, you find them, give me a call. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't know. I don't have an answer to that. I'm not really geological. Yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, there's a distinct possibility or something analogous to it, I guess I would say. Yeah, the, it, it is curious that this nation, which was founded as a maritime nation, we were once a, a leading shipbuilder in the world. We can't build the largest ships now that are in the commercial shipping fleet anywhere in the United States. We don't have any shipbuilding facilities to do it. You look over at our two major ports, you'd be hard pressed to find any ship flying a US flag, regardless of where the ship was built. And, and it, it, it's ironic that here we are sitting between the Atlantic on the east, the Gulf of Mexico on the south, the Pacific on the west, the Arctic uh, on the north, one of the largest, probably the largest exclusive economic zone of any nation in the world. More than half of this country is underwater, and we're not using it to benefit society. I think it's a, it's a terrible comment on, on our creativity and our innovation, and we know that we're going to turn to the ocean more in the future. We are losing the capacity for large-scale projects in the ocean. And, and if you look at sea level rise and what's happening, other countries are, are building floating islands. They're thinking about moving ports off, off out into the ocean. And, and we're not doing looking at any of those. We've lost much of that capacity. I, Jason, any last words of it for us? Uh, no, I think that's it. Thank you well, for having me. Well, I thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Oh, I'm